will be appropriate here. All right, I guess we'll get going. Um, it's five after 10 now. It, again, this is, you know, a little obviously very informal. Um, it'll begin to get more formal as time goes on with us. And I'm going to be continually admitting people, which is, which is fine. But I'd like to welcome you all aboard. Um, obviously, some of you have some experience as athletic administrators. Uh, some don't. This might be your first gig. But what we're trying to do is get some kind of mentoring program together for you, some availability of people within not just the state, but within your section as well. Um, so we have some people with us today that are uh, a big part of what we do in the AAA. And some of you have taken advantage of the uh, LTI coursework already. Congratulations on those that started out last week with 501 and 502. And we'll be continuing those on. I know a couple of you might even have taken uh, uh, 705 or, or 503 or 506 yesterday. Uh, it was a pretty busy day. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce some very key people in the New York State AAA. Uh, first is our mentoring chair, Denise Kiernan from North Salem. Denise is um, quite experienced as an athletic administrator. She was here on Long Island, then we lost her, and she's working her way upstate uh, now. She was at uh, Sleepy Hollow, right? for a couple of years, Denise? For a hot minute. For a hot minute, and then uh, ended up in North Salem, which by the way is beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, we were up there for lunch one day and we may go up there again because it was just uh, just a beautiful little town. I'm not I'm not really that much of an upstate guy, I'm more an island guy, I'm learning as I go along. They're really nice places upstate and North Salem is certainly one of them. Uh, also with us today is our um, uh, president, uh, vice, is it vice president? Uh, of the association. Also, the professional development chair is uh, Greg Warren. Some of you may have met Greg. Greg's at New Paltz. Greg was in, originally a chapter four um, a athletic administrator. Now he's moved on to chapter nine. And Greg is in our, on our executive board and in the rotation. He's also one of our key instructors. Um, he's done 502, 503 for us recently. And uh, we look forward to him. Uh, presenting today on the Aspiring Administrator Program. And finally, Steve Young. Steve is our LTI chair. Steve is probably one of the most uh, noticed and uh, visible instructors that we have. Steve can just about teach any course. In fact, he's the author of uh, LTC 628 on mental health for student athletes, which we will be offering at the conference. Um, Steve, is there any other courses you authored uh, weren't you, weren't you on another one? I'm, I'm course chair and I, I've rewritten 709. He's rewritten 709, and, and 627, right? And 627, the uh, sports conditioning. Yeah, so Steve is very active at the national level. And uh, again, one of the go-to guys when I need a, when we need instructors, Steve is not afraid to, you know, pick up the uh, microphone and get on and teach a few classes for us too. So it's a great asset. Steve's in chapter one. Um, right now at New Rochelle and like all of us struggling with all the things that we struggle with, uh, such as buses and bus drivers and officials and everything else. But today, really what we're going to do today is hit you with four quick ideas or quick subjects um, and in a general way and just touch on some things to get you indoctrinated into how this mentoring program will work. So. Steve is going to, we're going to let Steve open it up if he's ready, uh, talking about the new rule on likeness, then Greg will kick it in with the aspiring AD. Uh, I'll jump in with uh, evaluating coaches, and Denise will finish up with coaches and parents meetings. And so we're going to do about 10 or 15 minutes each. That's it. These little snippets are meant to inform and give you some good ideas. So if you, Steve, if you have to share, or Greg, if you have to share, you'll be able to, Denise, obviously. Okay, so we'll kick it off. Steve, it's all yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, as Jimmy said, we're, we're going through a lot in New Rochelle right now since we don't have facilities yet. We're not back in our office from the storm. Um, 
But the one thing I wanted to point out, I don't know if you ca captured it when Robert did the um, the eligibility workshops in your section, but the name, image, and likeness is is coming up. And that was a change to the amateur rule in the state. So the name, image, and likeness is similar is what is going on with college athletics now where kids can monetize their name, obviously their image and their likeness now, and it's not considered payment of athletes. And the way it's done at colleges is a lot different though. Colleges will bring in outside companies to help um, facilitate that for the kids. So you got a kid down in Texas that left school early to go to Ohio State where he's preparing to be the starting quarterback because his name, image, and likeness value was in the, well into the six figures, if not the seven figures. Um, so what they did in New York State is they jumped ahead of it. And Robert Robert's um, feeling was any from, from based on legal counsel is if a kid challenges the amateur status rule on name, image, and likeness, the state would lose. But it's important to get out to your kids. The difference will be your kids cannot promote where they play, they can't promote the school, they can't promote the section, they can't promote the state. So if a kid's working at Joe's Car Wash on Main Street in New Rochelle, he can't say, I'm Steve Young, I'm a football player at New Rochelle High School and I work here, come by and visit and I'll give you an autograph. And the, the car wash owner gives him 500 bucks to do it because the kid was probably making eight bucks an hour washing cars. Now he gets more people. He can't say any of that. So if he goes on social media and does that, plays in your next football game, he, he'll be ineligible and your team can be susceptible to, um, to forfeits. So you have to be careful with this. So the kid, Steve Young can work at Joe's Car Wash, be a football player, but I can't say where I play, where I am, what section, anything. I can't even wear my gear to show where, where I am. It's just that, hey, I like to play football. Come by and see me, and we can talk football. That's all you can do. So please be aware of that. Not, most of us are not monitoring the kids' social media accounts. But if it comes up that it happened, you're going to be, you're going to be um, on the hook for, for reporting a kid that's playing in your games that was making money off his name, image, and likeness, but using the school as a tool for endorsement, and you can't do that. So be aware of that. Let the kids know that. Let the parents know that. Um, that's really important. Jimmy and I were talking about that yesterday. So please, I'm not sure a lot of kids know about it, but it's out there and it's important to know just like a kid that, that goes bowling in the summer and plays in a money league, that they're going to be ineligible. So we have to be careful with this new rule. It's just another, another piece on, on the work that we have to do in terms of compliance issues. I hope, Jimmy, I explained it well, and I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I think you did. And if, and if any of you have questions, I, I think the best way, and I probably should have gotten this before because of the amount of people we have, you can put them in the chat, and then one of us will monitor the chat so we can answer those questions. I guess the big thing is, Steve, is this, and the question I might have for you is, is this going to be a self-reporting thing, or if somebody rats on us because they saw something on social media, you know, is that, what's the, What's the danger here, I guess, is the, is the biggest thing? The, the danger is that we're not, none of us are monitoring kids' social media accounts. So you got to put that on the coach. Um, and, and what's going to happen is somebody will see it and report it. And that's when we're going to be on the hook. So that's and the I, important part to, to remember. And I think because if we, you know, obviously following kids' accounts is not something we – necessarily should do as adults um, or have them follow us back. You know, we should be very careful about those things. But now we do have to really monitor social media for this because kids are self-promoting, which is fine. You can self-promote, but that's the showing clips on Huddle or something along those lines. But this is a very, very important rule, especially with what's going on. Um, Cruz got a question, Steve. Is the athlete ineligible for the next game or the entire season? I think it's I think it's the entire season. If they do it because they're getting money, again they're breaking the amateur status because they're getting money using promoting their position on a team. 
or yeah. positioning themselves with Section 811-1 or New York State Public High School. If you get up there and say, hey, I was a starting quarterback on the New York State Public High School Class AA football team, come visit me and we'll have a talk or I'll sign your jersey, that's going to make you ineligible. Yeah, that would make sense because this is, you know, it's it's funny about this. Here's a kid innocently promoting himself, perhaps, or whatever, for, you know, whatever a little bit of reason to make 10 extra dollars. And a kid who spits on a referee is only gone for a game. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it's, it's it, sometimes our roles, you know, hamstring us a little bit and we kind of shake our heads. But, yeah, that's that was a good question. Um, the second one is what if they play multiple sports, Steve? I honestly don't know that one. My my guess would be, it would it would probably be that sport. I can't imagine you're going to declare a kid ineligible for the entire year because they they made five hundred bucks. I I wonder if that went to court. If that would hold up for an entire year. I th I think what will happen there is it'll it'll be tested once it happens. You Absolutely. know, and that's I think when you'll end up getting some answers to this, some deeper answers is if it actually does happen you know, what's going to be the litmus test for this, because it'll be precedent setting. The first case will be a precedent setter. Well, and absolutely. Sure will... Unless the kid gets gets on TikTok and says, hey, I play football, basketball, and baseball. Come see exactly. me, you know, or I'm, I'm working here every season, stop by. Um, that, 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 could, that could be a uh, game changer. Denise, you had, a, you had your hand up? I did. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Um, just a... Uh... To add on to that, um, in section one, we did have an appeal from a school district regarding a situation very similar to this. And I think the important key factor is to keep record of everything that you are shared information with. If you hear something from a parent, if you hear from something from another coach, another school district, because if you have to appeal it in support of your community and your student athlete, you're going to have to have evidence of when you were informed, how you were informed, and what takes place throughout the entire process. The athletic director that um, had the appeal did a very nice job in painting the picture of all the things he did to, sh to show due diligence and show that he was demonstrating that he was probing probing the parent, bringing the parent in. He met with the parent on such and such date, questioned the parent. So he had a, a running record. So if you do have to appeal it to show your community that you're supporting that student athlete or that coach, you have the evidence there. It's a great point. You know, we're going to talk a lot about papering the trail throughout sessions that deal with uh, discipline, whether it's of a student athlete or of a coach or of a spectator. Um, but again, papering the trail becomes a very big part of what we do. So thank you, Denise, for that. Thank you, Steve. Greg, do you want to kick it into the uh, aspiring AD, which some of you may or may not know about? Sure. You able to share, Greg? I think I yep. do have to make you a host. Here we go. There you go. You see it okay yeah i got it fine all right so I, i'm just kind of going to go through this quickly for everyone um the aspiring athletic administrator program is something that we uh piloted a couple years that, that jim spearheaded and then last year we rolled it out and i kind of uh, uh controlled the program for it last year with a lot of help from some guest speakers but basically uh you know, we, we, we know that there's a, a need for uh, people to come into our profession and, and fill positions, and there's maybe not uh, enough qualified people out there. So we're trying to uh, target people to come into the profession who may have an interest. And, um, you know, as from last year, we have nine successful graduates that were in the Aspiring AD program that are now AD. So we're very happy and, and proud of that as an organization. Um, basically, it, it, they're given an overview of the job of the director of health, phys ed, and athletics. And we're trying, we're morphing it now more uh, to give some background on that and really preparing to apply and interview to grab that position, to be prepared for it and ready to get it. Um, you can see the outline here, some of the uh, 
the sessions that we're going over. But again, there's a, a big focus on the interview process and the application process. Target audience, we're now looking at uh, newer college graduates as well as established PE teachers who are the, you know, the logical choice to, to come in and, and take the next step into athletic administration. So again, people that you may know on your staffs uh, that are interested, we hope that you uh, share the aspiring AD program with them and hopefully they get in it. Again, as I mentioned, had a lot of help. We had different speakers. I didn't do all of the uh, sessions. I did some of them. Here's a list of some of our uh, New York State AAA members and uh, athletic administrators across the, st the state. Obviously, Denise, Steve, Jim was part of the interviewing process as well. You may recognize some of those other names there too. You know, being part of it provides a support system and networking. Um, the participants get to know each other. They're communicating with each other. They, they're emailing me all the time. Different speakers, they came in, kind of ring a chord with them, and they, they reach out to them like, hey, what do you think about this? So the participation in the program also provides a, a support system. So if you, you need help, you need support. I just sat with a um, someone who was in the program last year and did an hour prep for an interview with her. And there's no, that's just a support system that we're offering. To. information on the program costs and we'll be rolling out a flyer and sending it out you'll see that um we'll shoot that out through amp soon and again with completion with it you also get uh ctle hours nine mentioned a little bit about the success we've had nine people who um as of this week who have gotten jobs someone just got a job appointed last week so uh, we've had a pretty good success rate with it um We've had a lot of people in final rounds and uh you know they're, they're continuing on they're gaining experience and they're going to get a position that's really uh really it in a nutshell and again and again the reason the reason why we rolled this out to you this is part of our three-pronged attack at uh giving athletic administrators context about the job and one of the problems was is most of you who are in the position now may not have grabbed that context going in unless you were working directly with the athletic administrator and answering those same questions that are answered at the interview. It's, you know, or you just were happen to be a warm body that they needed to throw into the position, unfortunately. And that seems to be the way it is. So our goal with this is to have every athletic administrator hired from 2022 on having had at least gone well, through did. the inspiring AD program. Steve, mute. Steve, mute. Uh, mute. I don't need to hear about your bus problems. <laughs> um, and then see about the um, the context that they need to get into that position. And then the mentoring portion is what we're doing today. And then the professional development portion is the future part to sustainability in the position. So we copyrighted this. It's called AMPD, A A M P D, and it's really more of a trendsetter nationally right now because they're starting to model in that vein. You know, Greg and I are going to be going to Turning Stone if anybody is heading there. Uh, to do a full presentation on the aspiring AD program because that's where all the physical education teachers are. And 90% of us in the state uh, are physical education certified. Now, I know a lot of you, uh, or not a lot of you, but a, but a few of you may be in a smaller school where you're an AP, you're a dean, something along those lines, and you don't have a phys ed degree. They have maybe a teacher as a director of physical education. So that's why we have that secondary prong with professional development through the LTI classes and ultimately certification, uh, which for right now is national. But again, as you may have heard, we're fighting for that too. Uh, Cameron has a question, how diverse is the pool, are the pool of candidates? It's just, that's a good question. It's as diverse as the pool becomes, I guess, from when it opens up. So we are uh, doing our best to bring in 
a variety of candidates and educate them. I've talked to Harry and a couple on and Ashley uh, Chappelle and a couple of other uh, people of color to get into the positions because that is lacking. We know that for a fact. Uh, female athletic directors, uh, athletic directors of color uh, are not prevalent in New York State, but we have to build from the base to get that to happen. It's not going to be a top-down situation. So we're going in to grab those aspiring athletic administrators, identify people within to apply for the position or learn how to apply for the position. Because that's the other thing. They don't have the knowledge of how to do it. They just see a posting on OLAS. And then they go in and look at the criteria. Well, hell, that's all the same. So we want to get that word out there that this is open to everybody that wants to be an athletic administrator. I mean, we could turn around and say, why would you want to do that? <laughs> I mean, Gavin and I are only 39 years old and looking at us, you know, and this, this is what the job does to us, you know. So just remember these things going forward that we're here to give some context. But we also want to network and reach out. So, again, this is a network and we start to identify people. And we we just wrote a resolution on diversity. In fact, our New York State resolution, which I'm on the National Resolutions Committee, and not to take any extra credit for it or give myself a pat on the back, the national uses our language in their addressing of the need for diversity and equality in athletic administration. So we're trying to wake people up, I guess, for the lack of a better word, that this needs to happen because right now, like on Long Island, I'll tell you right now, there's jobs open, it's musical chairs, but there's more chairs than players. So we've got to find people that want to work in this job and educate them and drive. It's, it's Edward Deming said, the one thing you have to do in business is drive out the fear. And that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to drive out the fear with this type of program. So uh, Greg's done a tremendous job with it. We rolled it out on Long Island about three or four years ago. I think to date, well, there's nine just recently. We have, we're up to 14 now that have gone through our program and gotten jobs as athletic administrators. So we look at this as a positive program and, uh, you know, we're going to look for your help too. I know you guys are brand new. You're not going to give it to your, you know, somebody who's going to replace you today but somebody who might want to replace you if you move on to another school, you move up, you retire, you know, all different things can happen. So I hope that answered your question, Cameron. It was a little long and drawn out, but thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Okay. I'm going to jump over now. I'll take the, I'll take the reins and try to keep it. We're right on schedule. It's 1030 now. So we're going to talk a little bit about evaluating our coaches and uh, I'm not going to do that one. Hang on one second. Google's a little uh, a little different for me in Zoom for some reason because I'm at the school today. So I'm going to do it with a window. Okay, let me know when it let me know when it kicks in where you can see it. Am I sharing yet? Not there yet. No, there it goes. It's starting to kick now. Okay. So when we talk about evaluating coaches, it's it's really more about who's on your team to begin with. So we took right away to Jim Collins. And, you know, Jim Collins is one of my favorite guys and good to great, even though the book may be a little bit outdated. But it's, it's really a matter of getting the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. And I know that might be difficult in our situation sometimes because we have those um, uh, those union issues that we may have to deal with or the, the process to remove a coach may be a little bit difficult. But evaluation is the critical piece to it. And we, this is the beginning of the papering the trail subject. So if we have a coach that we need has to grow a little more within what they're doing. And I know you guys are brand new and you haven't really had a time to assess, but let's say we do have a coach that we want to keep and then they've shown that they can do the job. So we want to have those developing a professional growth plan for them. Uh, the biggest thing is really identifying the areas of need. And you get that through your evaluation. And I'll show you uh, 
I'll show you an evaluation, just a simple evaluation form in a second. You may have one uh, that you use, which is fine. But in those become setting of goals. What kind of support are we going to give? And that's the difficult part. Uh, we don't necessarily have the tools to give support to someone unless it's through some kind of mentoring program within your own district, whether it's accessibility professional development through coaching, which there is a myriad of, uh, of areas out there that these coaches could get involved with. Um, how often are we going to assist that person? Is it one where we have to be there once a week? Are we going to have a little sit down? Are we going to do it once every two weeks? Is it going to be more after a game or just casually as the season goes on, are we going to provide that support? And then we also talk about off season support and the preparation for the season too. When are we going to be able to do that? And then the coach needs to be able to take accountability and what specific actions they are going to do to grow. The toughest conversation here to have is dealing with a coach who may be a little bit narcissistic and don't think that we all aren't narcissistic to a point is how are we going to have that discussion and what will the coach recognize is wrong that they will take accountability for that they will grow with. So they talk about nationally using a three-year model. Now, Obviously, you're going to see in a little bit, maybe that's not going to last three years, depending on the coach. But if we really look at it from this point and think about it from your own position as a growth position, as a new athletic administrator trying to get to tenure in three or four years, depending on your situation. But the in-season assessment, obviously, the postseason one is one we all do. And doesn't really matter how you do it, whether it's through coach evaluator, whether it's through another uh, plan, but it's the in-season walkthroughs that we do that really starts to develop a pattern of that coach. So we offer or we ask that there's three or four observations per season. And again, you're probably out there, depending on the team and just being there visibly, you could go to 10 soccer games. Those are 10 opportunities to do an observation in a game situation. You may be out there for four, two or three practices a week even. But when you want to really observe, you have to document. So the casual walkthrough usually happens and someone turns around and says, well, you know, I just saw something wrong today. Can we talk about it? Certainly those work. But if you know that there's an issue with a coach, you want to start to paper that trail and start to document things so that you can get to some kind of agreement on how it should work. The season end evaluation should be summative and for formative, um, summing up whether you do it through a Likert scale, whether you do it through a, uh, you know, well, the one, two, three, four is a Likert scale, whether you do it through a general evaluation piece or a narrative, it really doesn't matter as long as there's consistency in it. Now, they talk about using parent and athlete data. Uh, well, that data is not necessarily in the form of an official survey uh, because I know that those are out there. but at the same time, we want to make sure that if letters come in, if there's little rumblings on social media, um, we want to make sure that the coach is aware of these things. We don't want to hide them. We're not going to sit there and hold them to the end. And then all of a sudden the season's over and go, by the way, you got six emails from, you know, five different parents about playing time. Those things certainly have to come to the coach ahead of time. And you want to be able to address it right away. And the use of data to find professional growth, the data, again, could be quantitative. It could be qualitative. It really doesn't matter. But as long as you're using that data that you've collected uh, to make those decisions. Now, it's our job to make sure we provide the resources. So if they need some release time or they want to go to clinics, make sure your travel and conference budgets have enough, not just for you to attend the national or to attend the state conference, but you have enough time in there for uh, coaches to be able to go for a weekend to a good conference. Now, I know it's the responsibility of a coach to go to uh, these things and actually go to workshops. That's difficult. I mean, within our own profession, it's sometimes difficult to get athletic administrators to go attend good workshops at conferences. And really, that's on you as an individual. So we would hope that that coach gets it. Offering up print materials. Uh, maybe putting together a, a, uh, a file, a Google file uh, with it, a folder that has those things. Uh, Greg Warren is our uh, Sparky Rector guy. We're going to be building a Sparky, Sparky Rector professional development assistance 
folder a little bit bigger than it is, and you'll think, see things like this dumped in it. You'll have access to. Uh, if the coach needs equipment or video materials, obviously, but if the coach needs equipment, you've got to be accessible to that coach to listen to that coach talk about what they need and see if it's reasonable within your budget. Now, if it's not, but you know that it's a necessary item, you have to look at other avenues to make sure that coach gets what they need. If it's through the booster club, if it's through fundraising, if it's through a donation, look at those ways or those options to get the equipment you need, especially, you know, a football team needs a seven man sled. Well, usually an A deal say, can you get away with a four man? Well, no, there's five offensive linemen. At the minimum, I need a five-man. So maybe you're just buying a five-man. Um, that's some ways to get around it. But at least you know that those purchases, those major purchases have to be done. And then your sports-specific supplies and materials, it's incumbent upon the coach when they do their budget to make sure that they know exactly what they need and they're not just ordering for the sake of ordering because we do tend to do that too when it's not our money. We go shopping and we end up keeping things locked up in the closet because we just look good in a catalog and we want to make sure that those things get to us when they need to get to us. Uh, this can be abbreviated, obviously, for gross incompetence or a major law or policy violation. Uh, does that happen? Yes, it does, unfortunately. But again, if you have to remove someone for gross incompetence, there better be some kind of paper trail unless it's one incident that's right there and so visible that there's no argument by anyone. But if it's fully implemented and a deficit still persists, that's a defensive, uh, defensible rationale for termination. You can develop that. So having that three-year model in place, knowing that there is a three-year model and showing zero growth throughout those three years and the discussion ensues, that gives you the opportunity to remove that coach. And three years might seem a long time, but it really, it really and truly is not. Now, right here is a simple example. And again, I have this is this is going to go into that Sparky Rector pack that I talked about. But this talks about documentation, talking about how the coach didn't collect game jerseys, uh, dealt with a specific item in their coach's handbook. Uh, skill development wasn't there. Asked about the plan for uniform and uh, at the interview did a good job, but made no mention of it of the allowing seniors to take their game jerseys. What he's done there is given a gift of public funds. Those things are bought, paid for by the taxpayers of the district. You cannot just give out uniforms without some kind of remuneration by the athlete because that is a gift of public funds. And when the auditors come in and see where do all the football uniforms go, they're $100 a piece, and you just gave away 25 of them. Well, that's wrong. You just can't do those things. So – Something as simple as just putting in an inventory system for this coach was a good way to uh, start to document and simulate that little uh, that little corrective action play there. And I'm going to stop my share here. And that takes a second to kick out, I hope. Am I still there? It's there gone. Yeah. Okay, it's gone. It's gone. Poof, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if there's – those are those little things when you do have those discussions with the coaches, those are the difficult ones to have, you know, and sometimes we open up with a question, you know, how do you think the season went? And they were two and 16. Well, obviously the season didn't go well. So you can still employ the same qualities that you would employ with a parent when they're dealing with a problem. You need to show some empathy for the coach and understand that there may be difficulties that coach is going through. And hopefully you're building a relationship with that coach where you can share those ideas and that build that trust within a coach. That's the one thing that I, if we have no other qualities we need to have as mm -hmm. athletic administrators, whether it's a good conversation or a bad conversation is having the trust between the two that we can both say the things that we need to say. Now, getting a coach to change is something that's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to get people like us to change when we are set in our ways and if those ways are perceived to be successful. So empathy to the situation, trust in what we do, and the discussion is a little easier to have 
especially if we have to do some kind of discipline issue. And we also get stuck with, you know, our evaluation uh, forms that we use. If you're using, say, a one through four evaluation, uh, just like we did in phys ed with the highly effective, effective, uh, developing and incompetent, basically, uh, how do we give a coach a three knowing how they are and they think they deserved a four? How does that conversation go? And usually that comes to a negotiation. So now when you get those conversations where, you know, if you give a coach all fours, the first year you're there and the first year that they're coaching and they get all fours, you're never going to be able to give that coach a three or two, forget the two, but you're never going to be able to give that coach a three unless you have something hardcore that you can show them. So do we give threes purposely? So they have something to aspire to be very careful of those things. And that's why sometimes the Likert scale isn't the best tool to use. It looks good. It gives you clean data, but it may not be the best to use. So evaluate your evaluations. And if it's a union issue to change it, work with the union on it. Coach Evaluator has a very simple, so it's a very simple software program. If you're not using it, I know Dave and I use it. Um, we customized an evaluation form there. You can tweak it again and again and again and again if you want. But Coach Evaluator as a software package is excellent. It's inexpensive. Uh, I think on the order of $300 maybe a year for, for use of it. Um, but you can develop it yourself. But remember, the narrative, whether you can write or not, becomes a key point. If you're not a great writer, just pull it in your narratives. Don't have to write the preamble to the Constitution every time you do an evaluation. So just remember, keep it simple, to the point, have those tough discussions, support your coaches in whatever they think they need. And, you know, some of you might have a, a hundred of them and they all want, they all want. These are all, these are all children of want and need. So we're there to help them. Let's do our best. So does anybody have any questions? comments excellent i like that denise yeah jim i want to thank yourself. you i want to thank you for going to the heart of the matter um is the the individual that works directly with the student athletes that we uh work with and our communities and our families um a superintendent once said to me you know athletics is the front porch of this school district and in many school districts it is and this is the only part of the school district that is public 100% of the time. Whereas our classrooms during the instructional days are locked doors in the front of the building and closed classroom doors that are not public. So everything that happens is public and moving. And Jim could not have started with a topic more, more critical than the evaluation of coaches. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if you look at the areas of focus, um, I attended an AD Insider last year when we had a lot of time on our hands in COVID. And there was a presentation. At the end of the presentation, there were four areas of focus with coaches that you should be looking at. The first one was participation. How many students are participating overall on your team and in the program? Varsity, JV, middle school. So when you meet with that varsity head coach, that's something that you want to keep in mind is what is that participation level in the program and what are you doing to get your numbers up? For example, we have a field hockey team. Hello to my section one friends, Drew and Dan, um, who are in the um, regionals on this Sunday with no JV, but a middle school that's just skimming by. But we are holding clinics. We're putting effort to make sure that that participation rate is there and we're going to have to do something a little different because we don't have the numbers there. But my coach is vigilant about offering clinics in the spring and in the summertime to make sure that that participation rate is coming back. Retention, number two, how many student athletes are coming back every year to your program? And if they're not coming back, why? Number three, the student athletes experience, the confidence that they have with the coach and with other players, the connection, the competence, and the character. What are they carrying within that program from that leader of that, of that sport? And then finally, competitiveness. How well do your teams compete? Are they qualifying for playoffs? 
Are they, um, you know, you know, plummeting every every uh, season? What is it that you can do to help them become more competitive? So the four areas of focus: participation, retention, the student athlete's experience, and finally competitiveness is really what you look at in the area of focus when you're looking at a coach in terms of the long term. Like Jim said, what does that look like in the bigger picture? So I just thought I would share that with you because it's it's in line with what Dr. Wright was talking about. And I thought it was pretty interesting on the podcast. I don't know, Jim, if you heard that one, but I thought it was neat. You did hear it. Okay. Um, so uh, many of you um, have heard that Jim Wright, myself and Steve and uh, Greg Warren um, are really working together for a three prong approach for this mentoring program. It is grassroots. Uh, when we attend the national meetings, we attend with all the different mentors throughout New York state, uh, throughout the country. And there's a phrase that they use. And this is the phrase that I use every day when I come into the office, just be 1% better every day. If there's something that you can do that's 1% better than you did yesterday, that's all you need to do. This job can be overwhelming. It's, it, it is a monster and you need to be in control of it. Um, many things will happen throughout the day and you're gonna have to switch gears as you know already. Um, we are in transition mode. We're transitioning from the fall season to the winter season. I worked without a secretary for only three months in this office. I know some of you have been working without a secretary. I don't know how you do it, but I did it for three months and I was exhausted. What I would say to you is this, the transition period is the most critical period in athletic department. Ending out that fall season, collecting uniforms, meeting with coaches, um, cleaning up all the, your award ceremonies, and then transitioning into the next season, getting your coaches prepared. And that what brings me to the idea of the coaches meeting and the parent meeting and what topics should be covered. Listen, I've not been around very long. I don't know it all. I always want to learn and get better. So I'm gonna share with you my coach's agenda that has changed over the years. I've gone back in, I've, I've, I've changed things, I've moved things around, just because the times have changed. Many of you know that we've spent a lot of time on COVID. We've spent tons of time talking about COVID and everything else took a back seat. We've now become managers and less of leaders. And I'm trying to get that balance back by becoming a leader again and the management park just kind of pushing it out, pushing it out. So I'm gonna share with you um, my coach's agenda. And certainly if any of you at any point when I go through this, feel like you wanna elaborate, question, or just comment, please do so. Just unmute and talk. You don't even need to raise your hand because I won't be able to see you. Um, but I think it's important that we have a dialogue and you can um, hear. I think I'm doing this right. My entire screen. So let me go here. Can you all see an agenda? I don't know if anybody can see that. Can't see not yet. Not okay. yet. Okay. I'm not familiar with Google, so It'll let me try. It'll get there. No, as long as it says stop sharing at the bottom, Denise, you should be okay. It takes a second. There you go. Whoops, something yes. moved. Okay, no. let me go here. Can you see it here now? Not yet. So I'm on the bottom of the toolbar. I usually use Zoom and it says to share your screen. It says, present now, share, yeah, present now. So hit your- oh, I got it. I'm sorry, I had to click on it. I apologize, everyone. I have a lot That's to okay. learn. We'll Are be we doing good next here? week will be our technology session. We'll <laughs> Are we good session. here? There you go, there you go. Oh. So I'm not gonna read everything to you, but I'm gonna um, speak about the critical points. When I have a coaches meeting, I put everything in writing and we do a three ring binder with everything printed out and it's handed to the coach. Why? Because in a court of law, if anybody ever turns around and says, you never informed your coach of any material, I have evidence on a agenda and also in a binder for every single coach. I also copy the building principal, assistant principal, the nurse and the trainer. Very informational in the very beginning getting a little bit more informal. Before I get to the agenda part, my, my, my idea of coaches meeting has changed, it, changed over the years. I meet with the program. So yesterday I met with girls basketball, varsity, JV, and middle school. So if there's any basketball related questions, I'm meeting just with my basketball coaches. 
Tomorrow I'm meeting with boys basketball and so forth. I always invite my head uh, nurse into the meeting if she has anything important to say. Our athletic trainer will review our emergency action plan and go over medical kits and AEDs and some of the things that we require because of COVID, um, such as hand sanitizer, et cetera. Um, I always bring up MRSA. It's an old school term, but it is something that we always um, are bringing our attention to in terms of cuts and lesions and so forth. So our athletic trainer will go over all of those um, procedures. We then talked about COVID protocols within your section and your Department of Health. One of the things that we do daily is uh, Google attendance. So I can monitor it if in fact I have to contact Trace, I'm able to um, research it. One of the ways we communicate is through Sports U, um, and um, this is a platform where our coaches can speak to their families and players um, and uh, notify them, and we use the same code every year, and the athletic office also monitors them. So every single team in our program has Sports U, and that's how we communicate to our families and student athletes. Family ID registration, our athletic calendar, and our communication platform. Every student athlete must register in Family ID. If you are going to pursue the APP process, our Board of Education policy says that seven, uh, eighth graders may register for the high school in Family ID. And then we follow our Board of Ed protocol for the APP process, which in our school district allows only eighth graders to be moved up to the JV moving forward in um, all of our sports. I also always recap the New York State coaching certification. Why? Because anybody who reads this knows I'm holding everybody accountable to our process. I have a packet that I use in this office that when we hire a coach, it explains the entire process through five years through the National Federation pathway. I can post that, Jim, on the um, Google uh, shared drive um, so everybody can see it. Um, we start to roll it yeah. Our student athletes, I don't deal with parents or student athletes on anything having to do with physicals. Our nurse manages all of that. My nurse is um, works from eight to three, but doesn't work those hours. She's here from 6 a.m. till about 6 p.m. at night, very motivated and dedicated individual from the community um, and handles everything from nursing from A to Z. So now we get into the whole piece of like areas that have to do directly with coaches. So we have our rules and regulations for North Salem for being a student athlete and participating on our teams. Um, the NISFA handbook, the NISFA handbook, which is online, um, is something that they can use. I order rule books. Rule books could look like this through the National Federation. In New York State, there are some sports, I believe, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, it is softball and girls lacrosse that use the NC, I'm sorry, softball uses US softball, correct? US, USA softball, yeah. USA softball, and then um, girls basketball, I believe, is also NCAA. So right. you can order these rule books online, but I give them out in the binders with our coaches. And then, of course, score books and you know, um, dry erase boards that they order. Um, official rating procedures, those are included inside the binder as well in terms of how you rate officials in section one and what you're responsible to do. We also have a game and sideline policy in our school district. So I put it there to talk to them about who is allowed on our sidelines, on the games, and what we are expecting on the sidelines. You can see here, I'm not going to read, there's a lot of things that we address here that are informational for coaches. But the parts that are really important are, are when we get to the handbook. So um, you can see the guidelines for you know, conflicts with practices. Uh, we have a handbook that's very extensive, that's public on our um, website that paints the picture for how many times you miss in one season will remove you from a team. My athletic advisory is looking at that and reviewing that um, due to numbers. So we're not sure if we wanna stay within our rule right now for conflicts of practices. But again, it addresses field trips and excused absences. Um, and you'll see some of the things here um, and so forth. Um, the policies here, we have a vacation policy in our school district that's pretty harsh. Um, we are working through that right now as a school district in the athletic department to see what um, level we can um, really meet halfway with our student athletes and our families because um, we are noticing that no matter what we do, the vacation policy has to be there, but we also have to be flexible. One of the big ones is concussion guidelines and checklists. That's in the handbook as well. Our athletic uh, incident reports are there. 
um, and the thunder and lightning policy from NISFA, our heat and wind chill procedures. They're all in the binder printed out. Going back to the concussion guidelines, remember that on your website, by, by law, you have to have concussion information out there to your community, as well as your Board of Education policy. I think we've kind of gone by the wayside with concussion over the years, because we've really focused now on COVID for the last couple of years. Uh, we have a uniform policy, our academic eligibility policy, and our code of conduct. Then I go into supervision, talking about accident reports, talking about your game schedules, um, how you are to report that. We use a universal athletic calendar where everything goes on it from practices to games, and that is the Bible in our school. What do I mean by that? The custodians, the facilities director, the main office, everyone knows where we are and knows what we're doing. So it's not, I have to go to this website and find it out. It's a calendar that everyone uses. And then we just talk about important meetings coaches have to go to. Number 17 is critical. I think we lost the art of taking kids to and from an athletic contest. Many parents want to drive their kids home from athletic contests. I would be very careful with this. Um, there is feelings out there in COVID that parents should be able to drive their student athletes to games and pick them up. However, we are responsible by law for every student athlete on our roster. And we make sure that every student athlete arrives on a yellow school bus and in extenuating circumstances, they would provide a note to be picked up. Inclement weather, lopsided games, equipment, facilities, ejection policy, our officials readings, NCAA clearinghouse info. I talk a little bit about athletic placement process. The APP process is public on our school district's website. It is a parent permission slip. So if you visit the North Salem Athletics Department website, you will see there a parent permission. So really what's happening is if a student in eighth grade wants to play at a high school level, they will register in family ID. They will fill out the parent permission slip. They will be seen by our school doctor. And if they're approved through that process, they will test with me for the um, fitness portion. And um, I can tell you that by far, this is the best process that I have been involved in in a school district. It's very clean. I don't have to speak to parents. They're just going online and registering. It does include a club coach recommendation, and it also includes a recommendation from guidance regarding the mental health and wellness of that student athlete. So again, the athletic placement process is a part to some people's program that's very important. And maybe some of you don't have any student athletes showing and demonstrating that need. However, the state does allow for seventh and eighth graders to be moved up. Your board of ed policy would obviously have to decide whether or not you want seventh and eighth graders on varsity or only eighth graders moving up. We do allow athletic option in PE. Um, unfortunately, I say it that way, unfortunately, um, the commissioner's regs do allow 11th and 12th graders to be exempt from physical education if they participate in athletics. When I took this position here in North Salem, it was already in motion, meaning it was already in place. So if our student athletes are playing a sport in the fall season, they have to complete an application, submit it, get it signed by their phys ed teacher. And there's requirements you can see on our website, the forms are there, steal it, take it. It's not stealing, I'm sharing. Go on my website, use it, um, present it to your school and see if uh, it's something that you need to do or want to do. I'm not suggesting you should, but it is permitted by the commissioner's regs. The collection of rosters, when we want them back, why do we want managers and captains and grades and uniforms? Because the press wants them. So the more you can get from your coaches up front in an Excel sheet, the more you're prepared when the press asks you for that information. Typically at the end of seasons, when you're in playoffs, a lot of teams want to announce your teams. So they're going to ask you for name, grade, and uniform number. So it's important to get that right up front. Again, awards, we try to stretch academics. We have a lot of scholar athlete teams here. We are a school of uh, distinction um, here in North Salem. Um, and we do express to our student athletes that we want them to go to extra help, um, even if they are excelling. Our awards information, fundraising, weekly practice schedules, important dates, and so forth. Um, I do believe this will go in the hard drive for um, 
Can you see me now? I don't know what I'm doing in this, sorry. Stop presenting, so I should be good. Yeah, you're good, you're good. Uh, and so, you know, look, there's a million things. I will list a few things right now that I know were not included in that, but are covered. Um, the budget process is a process that I meet with every varsity coach. They come and see me and we sit down and we go through their, you know, requests. Medical waivers for postseason. That's something that's on my radar, um, meaning if you're competing in the postseason, you have to have six games that you've participated in to meet that requirement to compete in postseason. And one that's very important is practice requirements. So a lot of coaches will come to me and say, Kiernan, we don't have six, but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna actually um, count the warm up as a practice. The NISRA regulations don't allow you to count a warm up as a practice requirement. So again, I think it's important that at your coaches meeting you paint that picture very loud and clear because they're going to come to you at the eleventh hour. Then the phone's going to start ringing and the emails are coming in because you've got Susie who wants to, to play in the varsity soccer game on Monday and she only has five practices and it's Saturday. So again, um, the practice requirement thing is big. For me it is because I want to make sure that the coaches and student athletes know. I know I covered a lot. I know you know, um, it's not everything that um, certainly A to Z, but it's some of the key pieces that I believe are important. I also have another piece, but I don't know if we want to get into that right now, Jim. With the no, we're, gonna, we're 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 at the hour, Denise. We want to uh, yeah, we want to let them get to the you know get to their lives back. So you know the I, I you know I appreciate that, Denise, and thank you so mm -hmm. much for your presentation. And you know, again, what we're going to try to do going forward is really focus on maybe one or two individual items. So what you have today is a little bit of an overview of everything. And what we're gonna pull back on is you guys send us something you want us to talk about with you. We'll include that into the next presentation. And we're gonna do this every Wednesday for November on some general items and maybe touch on, we might dig deeper into the APP because you know Denise's situation is different. Um, then 90% of the school districts in the state, some don't have a rule, but as long as it's a board policy, which by regulation it has to be, um, it doesn't matter what it looks like, but your process to get it done needs to be consistent. So we may take little things like that and drill deeper into it. We're also gonna probably have something down the road about looking at and redeveloping your coach's handbook if you don't have a good one right now. And that's going to be a very intense one. So I'm looking forward to getting this going. Um, again, we're just scratching the surface here a little bit. The reason why Denise and I did our thing is because we are in a transitional place right now between seasons. So you're evaluating the fall and you're preparing for the winter. And you'll apply these same techniques. As I said, I recorded this. I'll send the link out. Uh, Denise put her email in there, but Denise is also on the email list uh, that we send out. I do BCC, you guys, so don't think I'm attacking you personally. Um, but at the same time, we have 162 new contact, 169 new contacts for new ADs. So, I mean, we all, we had 30 here today. I think that's a great start and we'll continue. So let's spread the word. Does anybody have any questions or comments going out? Either hey, Jim, next next uh, month, uh, Wednesday, we have that uh, BOCES meeting between Nassau and Suffolk, so we won't be able to have this meeting. Out away section. Yeah, no, you guys are doing that, so we're gonna figure that out. I might go. We might go a little later than that in that one. We might go at twelve. So you'll get a. We're gonna do it before you get out there on the field or something. So we'll be get it before two o'clock probably. So I have to change that one for Long Island guys, or I'll just record it at ten. We'll figure it out, but we're looking for some consistency. So, um, but you'll hear from me. I'll, you'll get an email on the next one, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ashley, you're yeah, I'm surprised you weren't on that one. I'll put you on that. That was we got the list, by the way, from you guys from your uh from your section reps gave us the list of new ADs. So if you weren't on that, if you are on that list, that's great. That's why you're getting it. But if a couple of people in here weren't, I'll take care of that and we'll add you in. Joe, you're welcome. Jim. Yeah. Jim, just one, one second. Um, if anybody thinks about something that you want, Jim, Dr. Wright, myself, Steve, to talk about. 
please either put it in the chat box now or email us so we can prepare for you. We have an idea of what we want to do, but we really want to address your thoughts and your, your concerns. And that's what this is. It's an open forum. And I forgot to thank all of you for attending. I think these kinds of forums are the best and most useful because you're going to hear things as we move through this school year of things that are going to help you, I hope. And I, I hope to be 1% better every day for all of you. 1% better. We're right on the hour, guys. It was a great job. I, I hope to see you guys soon. But uh, Ashley, I'll definitely add you. And uh, live long and prosper. Jim and Denise, you guys take questions real fast or not? Yeah, sure. Hi, Chris, go ahead. I got two questions. Um, each year at my school, we, uh, we have our coaches apply for um, – the position. So GV, varsity, whatever the fall sports, fall sports are. So my question is, if they are reapplying and our, our school district asks them to reapply, I don't necessarily have to hire them back as a coach. Every, every, yeah, everything is a one-year contract unless you have a union situation. So whatever the collective bargaining agreement is with the coaches and the teachers union, you have to follow that. So it depends on what's written into it. I don't know your specific situation, but really coaching okay. is a one-year contract. Okay. By so, standards. Yeah, th that's right. Because every year our union makes each one of them. I have to put in all the PAS. The union makes you do that. that. Yeah. That's good yeah. business. Yeah. That's good business. That's good. Yeah. You want to see that. So it, is, I, it is and it isn't if you have if you have 100 coaches that you have to continually rehire and do the paper trail on them it's it's a little difficult but i get you chris yeah that's yeah. it's your situation so do i still need to evaluate yes okay sure every right. single one of them okay now the only way you're going to be able to get rid of them or honor them okay you know so, so and then okay so where can i find that um that uh that evaluation paperwork that you guys have we're uh well coach evaluator is the software package i okay. suggest you go in there just to familiarize yourself with what those things look like if you don't have a formal one in your district right now but we're going to put them in a file and create that file of evaluations from different yeah. ad's and send them in that's awesome so you guys if you have one in there and you want to you also can support that if you have one you want to send us just email me back and i'll put it in i'll create that file no i would really like that because I'm going to need more moving forward. And then the other thing is, too, and Denise, this, this question is for you. Now, if you have coaches that are not following that six practice rule, how do you deal with that? Which rule? I'm sorry. The six practice rule, because we have that, too. You cannot practice so, what, your yeah. first game. So we have been the New York State regulation. We have been creative. We have held the practice for 45 minutes minimally in addition to a regular practice to help that child gain that six practice. Okay. But it's very far and few between. I don't make it public that I'm doing it. Um, and typically it's because a kid had an injury or something like that. Like they came in with an injury. So we're trying to work with them. Like I had a senior get cleared right before the last game of the season. Wow. So I wanted to get her in that game. So we held a Sunday practice with the team for 45 minutes to get that kid in. But there's not really much room for wiggle room there, according to the state regs. And then how do you deal with the coach if they ignore that? They just get the five or four practices and it's okay. Um, <laughs> you just miss them? Well, yeah, I mean, you would, you would, it's a letter yeah, I mean, you'd have to bring them in and put them down. I don't, yeah, see, I don't, I don't know about a letter in a file there. But you're saying if they played the kid without it? Yeah. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Oh, they played the game. Then that that's even bigger of an issue because that game is an L. You had an L. We also player. And eth ethically, we also have to report that we had an ineligible player. So you have to you have to do your own self reporting on that too, which is it's extremely difficult to have something wrong. That could be that could be the dismissal of the coach. It could be that serious. That's what I want. Can't to be know. Can't, the one thing you're going to learn from me is and, and the guys that know me in in section you can't be cavalier about the rules okay i mean the other guy down the block might practice on sunday and break the seven day rule but you you're not going to do it and you may not rat on him but you know you you, you want to maybe sidebar him and let him know hey listen man you're going seven days a week that's that's against the rules i'm tired of this can't happen and Ashley, chris you had your hand up um, I wanted to just follow up with Chris. And I and I think that if you have an ineligible player, that gets to a 
higher level. The hands are going to be tied right then and there. You're not going to have a choice. Your school district is going to either say, the section might say, you have to sit the coach the next game. And then your school district has to decide what you want to do with that coach, whether or not you're going to renew his, um, you know, position or if you're going to hire him as a coach because of that infraction. And there are many colleagues of mine, and I knock on wood, that have had this situation and it is not fun. And I can only imagine. So if you want to talk offline, you can always call me where I'm at. Okay? You're welcome. Awesome. Uh, Ashley, you had your hand up. Yeah, it was actually along the lines, too, of, uh, you know, coaching evaluations, the contract, and um, one-year appointments. So they want to discuss it um, in my district because they're up for contract negotiations. And so right now, um, if we can't find a coach, we have to – we can involuntarily force a phys ed teacher to do it as long as it's 60 days prior to the season the what's on the table is they want to say that um take that off and say that every phys ed teacher has to coach at least one sport and i'm like that, that's that, yeah that, you know what when they start mandate i mean we when you hire someone you expect them to coach you're expecting a phys ed teacher to coach because they're certified technically to coach anything you have i mean even though they might not have been uh, a basketball player, they can coach basketball because they took a one credit course in college on it, you know, and know the fundamentals of coaching. But when, when the rules like that come about, I mean, that's really up for the union to negotiate. Uh, your recommendation would be no because of life in general. And what if somebody has a family and wants that family or so family situation you know once you once you force someone to do something like that you'll probably have less people wanting to do it and come up with more ways to not do it yeah this is actually the union's idea because they don't like the um involuntarily forcing people to coach ashley just right. be careful this is being recorded just be careful this is being recorded got you yeah well we're not we're not sure you know yeah. yeah, I just want to know, like, is one enough? Because, like, right now we got, like, 80 coaches. And every season we're hiring, like, 10, 10 people. 10 new ones. 10 new people. Like, every season has been like this for a couple years. Um, but we've only had to really use the, the, the um, language once. So is retention, is retention a problem? Yes. All right. So, so really, that's what that's what you should work on. Then more it is just advice wise is the retention of the existing coaches or find out why coaches are leaving after one year or two years. Yeah. Uh, and, and whatever that problem is, because it sounds like it would be more of a systemic problem with outside forces. Yeah. Sometimes we do need a warm body, though, Ashley. You know, I know. <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes we grab the art teacher and say, you know, can you coach tennis for me? Uh, please, I'm begging you. You know, it, it, it happens to all of us. You know, small school, large school. Um, but again, forcing that the union issue, let the union deal with it. Um, you know, you, are you in a union yourself, a separate union? What yes, the uh, administrator's union. So you could even open up a discussion with your administrator's unit just to say this is happening in the teacher's unit. Because then, then if something becomes past practice in the teacher's they may want to pass practice, create a practice within your unit as well. Gotcha. Mandatory things. So, you know, you got a long way to go on that one, but good luck yeah. with that. Yeah. We meet on Monday. <laughs> yeah. And I'll add you to the list, Ashley. I didn't know All you right. weren't on it. Nah, cool. It's, I'm like, I keep telling people for my first three years, it's got to be a first year AD. You got first year COVID. Middle of COVID. Yeah, everything, everything's COVID. first year now. Yeah. <laughs> everything's first year. So thank you. Yes, you're welcome, dear. Anybody else? Again, thanks for hanging out. There's a few of you guys left. Thanks for hanging out. I really appreciate you. And uh, you can still live long and prosper. So a little Star Trek thing. Uh, Jim, can you hold on? When yeah, I'll stay on with you, Denise and Steve. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Hi, Dave. Take care. Good, good, good seeing you, Kyle. <laughs> Dave, <laughs> how's it going? All right. 
Dave's doing good. No tombs. Joe, I got to Joe's out. Okay. Everybody's gone. <laughs> Sorry Not about everybody. Google. I don't, I don't use Google that much. No, I, I usually don't either. I'll do them next time now that I know there's going to be less than 100 because our account is only for 100. So, yeah, so that was that. So, what do you think? I think they were engaged and I think they were paying attention, believe it or not. No, I do too. I thought we kept the, you know, kept the crowd for a while. You know, I, I mean, Denise, but brevity is going to be the thing here. You know, when we do something broad like that, you know, it's, it's hard for them to grasp. That's why recording it and putting that thing in the file yeah. is going to be good. But when we get into this, the next time, I know you can't be there next week. What time's your meeting over though? Mine's all day. Remember section one is all day. We have conference three, Steve, next Wednesday. He's on the phone. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're serving lunch afterwards. I, I, I can't commit to a time until after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So maybe we'll do it Thursday. Afternoon. Thursday, I can do Thursday later on the day. Veterans Day, school's closed. What's and Thursday? Thursday's school, Veterans Day. Thursday's Veterans Day. Thursday's your meeting? No, Veterans, Veterans Day. Day. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, I'll keep it to Wednesday. I'll do it myself and, you know, do a couple of things. Whoever wants to come on comes on. It doesn't matter to me. I want to try to keep some consistency, though. You know, I know the, you know, yeah. Section 8 and Section 11 are meeting, so I'll lose those guys. But, you know, they do their joint. And you're going to lose my guys, Dan and Drew, too. They were there. Okay. I got to run, guys. Yeah, me too. I got to get too. going to the next one. Right. I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, bye. Take care.